From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi! Eloi! Lama Sabachthani! Which means, My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Matthew made no reference to the time when the crucifixion began, but Mark indicated that it began at the third hour. Mark 15.25 It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. Around 9 a.m., Matthew noted specifically that from the sixth hour, which is noon, until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. In this period of darkness, Jesus became the sin offering for the world. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And here we see in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. So as we see in this period of darkness, Jesus became the sin offering for the world, and as such was forsaken by the Father. Near the end of this period, of time, Jesus could bear the separation no longer and cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema shabakani. These Aramaic words mean, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now we have a quote from Psalms 22.1. Here's the word of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Jesus sensed a separation from the Father he had never known. For in becoming sin, the Father had to turn and separate himself from his Son. Here in Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26, the Word of God says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement 
through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just in the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Some of those standing near the cross misunderstood Jesus' words. They heard Eloi, but thought Jesus was trying to call for Elijah. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 47, here's the word of God. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. In Greek, the word Elijah sounds more like Eloi than it does in the English. It's easy to think his lips and throat had become dry. Someone naturally would think a drink of wine vinegar would moisten his vocal cords so he could speak plainly. Others, however, said to leave Jesus alone and see if Elijah would come and deliver him. Their taunts were obviously still being directed against Jesus. With one last cry, Jesus gave up his spirit, pledging it into the hands of his Father. We see in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. See, Jesus was in complete control of his life and died at the precise moment he determined by dismissing his spirit. No man took Jesus' life from him. He had said in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Also in John chapter 10 verse 15, Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In John chapter 10 verse 17 and 18, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. See, he laid his life down in keeping with God's plan, and he was involved in taking it back up again in his resurrection. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. At the time of Jesus' death, three earth-shattering events occurred. First, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This curtain separated the holy place from the holy of holies in the temple. We know this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. Chapter 9 Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, 
and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now in verse 2, a tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. It was called the holy place. In verse 3, behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place. Now, the fact that it occurred from top to bottom indicated that God is the one who ripped the thick curtain. It was not torn from bottom by man ripping it. God was showing that the way of access into his presence is now available for everyone, not simply the Old Testament high priest. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. At Christ's death, a strong earthquake occurred, splitting rocks. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Now truly, the death of Christ was a powerful earth-shaking event with repercussions affecting even the creation. A third event mentioned was recorded only by Matthew. Now this is the third event in Matthew chapter 27 verse 52. And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Now the tombs of many holy righteous people were open. Probably this occurred at the Jerusalem Cemetery. The NIV suggests that these saints were resurrected when Jesus died and then went into Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So many others teach that since Christ is the first fruits of the dead, their resurrection did not occur till Christ our Lord was raised. So basically, these scholars suggest the tombs broke open at Christ's death, probably by the great earthquake. Then at Christ's triumphant death over sin, the bodies were not raised till Christ was raised on that wonderful first Easter Sunday morning. These people who were dead and came alive returned to Jerusalem, the holy city, where they were recognized by friends and family. Now we're going to see one of Jesus' uh, miracles, one of his very good friends, Lazarus. So let's turn to John chapter 11, verse 38 through 44. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, 
and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Our Lord is truly the resurrection and the life. Here's another beautiful miracle. We also see Jairus' daughter. She was dead. Christ raised her. Listen and enjoy. This is in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now Jesus just performs another awesome miracle. He's traveling through this town called Nain, and he comes across a widow woman, and she's in the middle of a funeral for her only son who's dead. Listen and hear what Jesus does next. This is in Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 17. Enjoy. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe, and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Now with all these wonderful miracles that Jesus did, raising these people from the dead to life again, they too pass through physical death again. Now some people may teach that they may have been raised with their glorified bodies like the Lord's. Whatever happened, our God is awesome. Now we come to the last part of this lesson. So we're in Matthew chapter 27, verses 54 through 56. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, 
and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And here we listen to another angle of the gospel. This is in Mark chapter 15, verse 39 through 41. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joses, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. The Roman centurion and other Roman guards were impressed and terrified with the unusual circumstances surrounding the death of our Lord Jesus. For such company signs that had never been observed in the previous crucifixions, their response was, Surely he was the Son of God. The earth-shattering events of the day struck fear into the soldiers' hearts. Now also there were women out there observing from a distance the Lord's death. These women had followed Jesus from Galilee and had been caring for his needs. Among the women in this group was Mary Magdalene. Now let's listen to Luke chapter 23, verses 47 through 49. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Matthew 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. In Mark chapter 16, verse 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. In the Word of God, John chapter 20, verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. People, he has risen. Jesus has risen from death to life. This was the first Easter Sunday ever. Our Lord Jesus was not there in the tomb. This is what makes Christianity separate from all religions of the world. Jesus was resurrected. He was no longer there. He rose from the dead. He appeared before many people before ascending to heaven. Now this is the gift God has given the entire world. Believe in Jesus and we too can rise to heaven forever with Christ our Lord. Do you know Jesus Christ? God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there is hope. Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him, you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. Jesus Christ died in our place. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, 
But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Today, you can become born again. We must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Do you feel a tugging in your heart? We receive Christ by personal invitation. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Receiving Christ involves turning to God from self, repentance, and trusting Christ to come into our lives and forgive us our sins and to make us the kind of people He wants us to be. Just to agree in your head that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for our sins is not enough, nor is it enough to have an emotional experience We receive Jesus Christ by faith as an act of will. You can receive Christ right now by faith through prayer. God knows your heart and is not concerned with your words as he is with the attitude of your heart. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Amen. Ron DeCiani is a renowned artist whose paintings have appeared at the Moscow Olympics and have hung in galleries, offices, and museums around the world. He's been hired by the biggest names in publishing and advertising, including best-selling authors Frank Peretti and Max Lucado. But he's probably best known for his painting, Spiritual Warfare, which has sold tens of millions of prints globally. Ron DeCiani was recently commissioned to paint the largest mural ever of the resurrection. It's 12 feet high by 40 feet wide. It took him two years to complete, and soon it will hang in the Museum of Biblical Art in Dallas, Texas. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single act in history that separates Christianity from every other religion, every other philosophy, and every other belief system. When I was commissioned to do that, my first thing was to immediately go to Scripture to try to understand this deep significance of the resurrection. And God gave me this incredible idea of having Christ emerge from the tomb, which I've never seen done before. I wanted to stop a moment in time when he grabbed the sides of the tomb and walked out. If you look at Christ on his belt, are the keys of death and hell. Christ is the central theme of the painting. However, we have a cast of characters. The first on either side of Christ are Moses and Elijah. They are the same ones that met Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Behind Moses is David, a man after God's own heart. He is one of the three people in the painting that are royalty that know to kneel before the King of Kings. Isaiah promised us the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. He gets to see him with his very own eyes. Behind Isaiah is Abraham. The Father of Nations gets to see the one who brings all of those to heaven. On the 
other side of Christ, Elijah, who was transported to heaven without dying, Noah now knows all that he went through for 120 years was worth it. Between Noah and Elijah, you'll see up above a dove flying past the rocks, the symbol of the Holy Spirit who literally raised him from the dead. Queen Esther, who was willing to perish, now sees the one who was willing to give up his life. Behind Esther is John the Baptist, who at one point in his life wondered, is he really the one? Now he gets to watch him walk out of the tomb. So he knows he's the one. In back of him, again kneeling, is Daniel. Royalty again. Daniel was a governor. If you look at the far right corner of the painting, you'll see Mount Calvary, also known as the place of the skull or Golgotha. That's where Jesus was crucified. And above the three crosses in the distance, you'll see a rainbow. Christ, the angels, and the guards are all totally physically represented at that moment. However, the cloud of witnesses on either side are all transparent at some point because they're in another dimension. Looking back at Christ, you'll see that there are special cracks right around his head, symbolically forming the crown of thorns he wore. And I wanted to sum it all up by his gaze upward of looking to the Father and saying, I did it. Because of this moment, pictured in the resurrection mural of Christ conquering the grave, we now become heirs and joint heirs with him, with the ability of accepting him as the Lord and Savior who rose from the dead to have eternal life.